All right, if you could turn with me, please, into 1 Timothy again. And we're going to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to consider this portion together. We may get to do the whole chapter. We'll see how time uh, goes. But beginning in verse 1 of 1 Timothy 2, he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Wherefore, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And again, God will bless that reading of his word to us this afternoon. So just to give you a quick outline of this section, in verses 1 and 2, you've got the idea of praying for all. Okay, so we're to come together and pray, and the scope of our prayers is all men. Okay, praying for all. And then verses 3 and 4 would emphasize the need for a passion for all. God certainly has a passion for all. Who will have all men to be saved? And we should be like God and have a passion that all men should be saved. And then verses 5 and 6, provision for all. Because it says there is a provision, one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. Okay, so there's provision for all. And then verse 7, there's preaching for all. Wherefore I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I am ordained a preacher. And then in verse 8, our last verse, there's not praying for all. In the sense that he says, I will that the men pray everywhere. We'll think about that, okay? So that's the little outline we're going to be following. But I want to begin just with this idea of the house of God at prayer. Because the Lord Jesus said that he would have that his father's house be a house of prayer for all nations, okay? So certainly the house of God is intended to be a house of prayer. And we would say that generally speaking... One of the great weaknesses today in church life is the prayer meeting. And that's why if we really want the house of God to be what God intended it to be, we need to see the importance of of the house of God. I want you to notice the phrase. In verse 1, he says, I exhort therefore that first of all. Now that little phrase, first of all, it means this, of first importance. Interesting. See, if I would say to you, what is the most important meeting of the assembly? I know what some of you would say. Immediately say, it's the Lord's Supper. Right? Anybody would have said that? I disagree. Now, woe betide me that I would ever want to diminish the importance of the Lord's Supper. I would never want to do that. But Paul says, of first importance is prayer. Because prayer and the prayer meeting affects every other meeting. So if you come together and pray earnestly at the prayer meeting, that at the Lord's Supper, that the the, the saints would come with baskets full and hearts overflowing with worship and adoration, you could actually affect the whole caliber of the remembrance meeting by the prayer meeting. You could affect the ministry meeting. You look at the calendar, you see who's preaching, and immediately you go, oh boy, you know, him, you know? (laughs) And and so what can you do? You can say, well, I'm going to complain because it's him. Or you can get on your face and say, Lord, would you give him a message from heaven? And a message like he's never had before, an ability to present that message in such a way that we'd know you were speaking. You see, the prayer meeting can affect every other meeting. 
And Paul says, of first importance. And tragically, the reason the church is in the condition it's in, because in our minds, the prayer meeting is of least importance. And I, if I could say this, I think that the church is in such a state today, and I think part of the reason is we're so arrogant in America because, you see, we made this great country, at least we think we did, and, and you saw we came and, you know, it was virgin territory and we made this fantastic country, and so there's this kind of independent spirit. We even have an Independence Day. No Christian should ever celebrate Independence Day. I'm not saying that as an Englishman. I'm saying that as a Christian. Because every day as a believer is Dependence Day, right? We're dependent on the Lord. And so an independent spirit is devastating to Christianity. We daren't be independent. We're God-dependent totally. And how do we express our dependence on God? In prayer is how we express our dependence in God. And so how come it is that even though we all recognize there's something gr drastically wrong, not just in our country, but in our assemblies, we recognize there's something wrong, how come the prayer meeting is so poorly attended? Well, you've got lots of excuses. But the Lord spoke a lot about excuses. People are full of excuses. In fact, one thing man is never sure of is excuses. What we indeed need is obedience, not excuses. In the prayer meeting should be the most important meeting in our minds. I need to be there and need to pray because I want the Lord's Supper to be what God wants it to be. I want the preaching to be powerful. I want lives to be changed. I want this assembly to be vibrant. And where's that going to change? It's going to fundamentally change at the prayer meeting. That's where it begins. I know this is not comfortable, but it's truth. It's the truth. And so he says, first of all, the first importance and we don't want to minimize the importance of the Lord's Supper, but what we want to say is that we want the Lord's Supper to be what God intended it to be. And the prayer meeting can affect that in a marvelous way. So, do we pray? Like, the other thing is when we come together to pray, what do we pray about? In many assemblies, all we pray about is sick people. In, on, in all honesty, right? It's, it's kind of a, it's a medical hit list. And, we're, and not, not that, you know, if that's nothing wrong with that. And, but, you know, it might be even good if you go and visit the person and pray with them rather than spend time at the prayer meeting praying for them. Just go to their house and say, heard you being sick, can I pray with you? That would do them the world of good. But when we come, we need to pray about a sick society. We need to talk about sick assemblies. We need to talk about the, the, the elephant in the room that we've, we've seen nothing but decline for 40 years, and, and it's getting so bad, there's very little left. And Lord, unless you do something, it's Ichabod, glorious departed, it's all over, right? So I think we just need to get real, and the prayer meeting is the place to do it. And so he begins to describe the kinds of prayer that should be prayed, prayed at the prayer meeting, and he talks about there are different types of prayer. There's supplications, and so he says, I will therefore, first of all, supplications. And supplications is, is an expression of a desire. It's, it's a great need. There's, there's an intensity to this word. It's a, it's a burden. It's when somebody comes to pray and they have a real burden. Uh, does anybody have any unsaved kids? Anybody have any kids that are, that are rebellious? the Lord. Oh, anybody got any uh, marriage difficulties that are not, like, we, we never mention these things, but these are the subject of supplication. This is, this is the object of, there's a burden here, Lord, do something with my wayward son or daughter or whatever, right? Do something. This marriage is, is hanging by a thread, Lord. Marriage is meant to glorify you. Lord, save this marriage. And there's an urgency. And I, I, we need that. We need to get real and pray about these things and pray with intensity. And that's what supplication is about. Are there not great needs today? There are great needs everywhere. Great needs. And so supplication. And then prayers, just more general in scope, just lots of different things. We should be praying about everything, but just more general in nature. Intercessions is conversations with God on behalf of others. Like Abraham, when he interceded over Sodom 
And you, don't you just love that? He keeps bargaining. You know, you know, what if there were, what if there were forty? And what if there were? Uh, why did he stop at ten? You know what I mean? You ever wonder why did he, why did he stop at ten? Keep going, Abraham. Keep going. The Lord's answering. Keep going. But that idea of intercession is it, it, this idea of a conversation with God on behalf of others. And God is amazing. It, it, that, that this powerful, almighty, omnipotent God would allow himself to be talked into something by mere human beings. And we can get into all the theological constructs, but the bottom line is this, that God was going to destroy the Israelites, and Moses stepped in and interceded, and God listened to Moses. I don't have to understand all the theological constructs here. I just know what it tells me. And if he did that for Moses, might he do it for a son and heir of God like us? He might, you see. So we need to intercede, enter into, into conversation with God. And then giving of thanks, that's the word Eucharista. That's why sometimes the Lord's Supper, some people call it the Eucharist, because when the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, it says he took bread and he gave thanks. Okay, And so we of all people should be the most thankful people. And it's good at the prayer meeting to have a time of thanksgiving. Is there anything to thank God for? Yeah, lots of things. And so time of thanksgiving is appropriate at the prayer meeting, right? Uh, let's, let's, let's take a few minutes to thank the Lord for his goodness. And, you know, part of the decline of a civilization in Romans chapter 1, it goes like this, neither were they thankful right? That's, the, that's why this downfall of a nation, because they weren't thankful for the many blessings that came to them from God. And I think it's good for us, of all people on the planet, we should be the most thankful people. And it says, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You, you can pray with thanksgiving and be smack bang in the middle of the will of God. Because he tells us it's the will of God to be thankful. And by the way, I want to tell you something. I, I think it's life-changing, Thank, thankfulness. And, and I can tell you why. I was, I was reading that verse and everything give thanks. And I'm saying, Lord, I want to be a more thankful person. Where should I begin? And it's like the Lord said to me, start with your wife. I thought, okay. <laughs> All right, Lord. So I, I started thanking the Lord for the wife that he had given me. And I don't know what it did, but it, cha- it didn't change her. It changed me Completely. I realized what a gift I had from the Lord that maybe I was taking for granted and, and the influence she's had on my life. And I began to, and it changed everything, even in the way our marriage operated. Thanksgiving is life changing. We should be thankful people. You see, we're a priesthood of believers, and we're called by God to intercede on behalf of our fellow men. <clears throat> men who refuse to pray or do not pray, we, as a priesthood, can pray for them. And we should. He says, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So he says, for kings. Now, it's, uh, let's be honest, it's easier to pray for a president you like. But it doesn't say, do you like the guy? If you do, pray for him. It says, pray for kings. You know who's king when he's writing this? Nero. Nero was a very, very wicked man. And so I I don't know what you think of the present president, but I want to tell you, compared to Nero, he's actually a really nice guy from what we know. Nero was horrendous. And yet he says... Pray for these men. And we should pray for them, for kings. Because again, they're not the enemy. If they're, if they're not what they ought to be, they're victims of the enemy. They're deceived by the God of this world. They're, they're, they're slaves to Satan. They need to be delivered. When did you last pray for Nancy Pelosi to get saved? Could God save her, do you think? Or is she beyond the pale? I think he could. Right? Can he save to the uttermost? Absolutely. And so he says, pray for all in authority. No matter how unreasonable they may be, they should be the object of our prayers. All that are in authority. 
And he says, for a reason. He, he says, we're to pray for kings, all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so we want the conditions to be suitable so we can live a life of godliness and honesty. And so a quiet and peaceable life is very important. And we, we read this verse already in a different context, but look at Acts chapter 9, and we're going to see something here, that when conditions are peaceable and tranquil, often there can be great blessing. And so it says in Acts 9.31, then had the churches rest. Now, of course, the reason is their chief persecutor had just been converted right? Saul of Tarsus. So it says, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. So there was a time of unprecedented blessing after the persecution ceased from the apostle Paul. And there was a multiplication. It wasn't just that God was adding to the, he was multiplying. And so this quiet, peaceable time was a great time of ingathering. See? So, so we want to pray that we might lead a peaceable and quiet life so that conditions would be suitable for the spread of the gospel and for the multiplying of converts. Not so we can pursue the American dream. That's not what it's about but it's so the gospel can spread. And so we need to be praying for that. And, you know, when, when you're, you're in a anarchy-ridden society, oftentimes your thoughts turn to survival, not revival, survival. You're just trying to get by, you see. And so when things are in absolute chaos and upheaval, you're just, how am I going to get my next meal? How am I going to, uh, how am I going to pay my next bill? How am I going to survive, you see? And so we want conditions to be nice and quiet and peaceable so that the gospel can spread. So pray for that, he says. And then notice he says four. <clears throat> he says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now, why is it good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior that we have peaceable and quiet lives? Again, it comes back to what I was saying, that there can be a multiplication, because then it says, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? That's, that's the reason why the peaceable and quiet life, and I think the church has missed that. We've had peace and quietness for quite a long time now, and we've not been involved in what we ought to have been involved in, and we've been pursuing the wrong things, and now the Lord's shaking things up a bit. And maybe we need to pray, Lord, restore the peace, and we'll get back to what we should have been doing in the first place. Who will have all men to be saved? By the way, I want you to notice that. It says he will have all men to be saved. Don't embrace a narrow theology that thinks that God only wants a few to be saved. That's not what the scripture says. It says, and he doesn't have two wills, who will have all men to be saved. That's God's expressed will. All men to be saved. And, and anything less than that is false doctrine. He will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at chapter 4. Uh, you, you'll notice chapter 4, verse 10. It says, For Therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Okay? Again, Savior of all men. Right? He came to save all men. And, of course, we know that not all men will be saved, but it's not because God doesn't want them to be saved. In fact, we're going to see that he paid a ransom for all, and I'm jumping ahead of the game, but I want to just say this. The only thing that limits the atonement is man's unbelief. It's not the heart of God. There's no limit to the atonement in the heart of God. And so, he's the Savior God. Wonderful to think of that, isn't it? Who will have all men to be saved. Come to the knowledge of the truth. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
So there's provision for all. All men are to be saved. That's God's will. But he's not going to lower the standard by making it easier for men. There's only one way to be saved through that one mediator. There's not many roads that lead to God. There's one mediator and only one. And so God is saying, I want all to be saved, but if you're going to be saved, it's on my conditions, my terms. And that is, you must come through my son. He's the one mediator. If you don't come through him, you're not going to be saved. One mediator, the man Christ Jesus. And it says, who gave himself a ransom for all. And so again, this idea of this, this ransom, for, it has all men in view. That's the idea, that, that the payment that he made was on behalf of all. That which is given on behalf of another as the price of his redemption. And so he's paid fully so that all men can be saved. And yet, men still are faced with a choice. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? And we, we have a responsibility to plead on, on God's behalf, to plead with men, to be reconciled to God through Christ. But we can do it. I, I, you know, I can't imagine believing a system where I only believed that God has only elected a few. And so I, I can't imagine preaching on whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved when in my back of my mind I don't believe it. And I'd think, my, you're, Mike, you're a fraud. You're, you're saying to them, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, but what you really mean is whosoever of the elect shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you have to play gymnastics in your brain to make all this fit, and it doesn't fit. And so isn't it just liberating to say, with clear conviction, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And believe that. I really believe that. And so this preaching is for all. Wherefore I am ordained a preacher, and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. And so this message that is intended for all, but it requires a preacher. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? And so <clears throat> notice he calls himself, wherefore I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles. Wow, what a piling up of terms for Paul. He said, I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher, I'm an apostle. Why don't you just say one rather than three? I mean, he's, I mean, he's really going overboard here, isn't he? Well, a preacher, it's to do with the message that he's proclaiming. Right? He's, he, uh, th- this idea of preacher is he, it's, it's the imperial herald. He's, he's proclaiming the message from heaven. And so he's a preacher. And, and so it's to do with the, the message. He's an apostle. That's to do with the authority behind the message. He's actually being commissioned by the risen, glorious head to take this message. And so he's, he's got authority, apostolic authority behind the message that he proclaims. And he's a teacher that he's able to explain the message in all its fullness. And Paul was all of the above. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, do the work of an evangelist. I don't suspect that Timothy felt that that was his gift. He says, endure afflictions, make full proof of your ministry, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, there's something missing in your ministry. It's not quite fully rounded, Timothy. You do the work of an evangelist. We need to do the work. By the way, it's work. And it's interesting, too, that the work of an evangelist is not restricted to males. Uh, Now, it might be where they do the preaching might be somewhat restricted. But if you look at Philippians 4, verse 3, Philippians 4, verse 3, it says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. 
Now, I don't believe that a woman should be the next Billy Graham should be uh, a woman. I don't believe that, right? But, but I was led to Christ by a woman. Some of the most effective evangelists I know are women who do it without in any way breaking the scriptural principles, but they're very dynamic in sharing the gospel. And so do the work of an evangelist. Wonderful to do the work of an evangelist. <clears throat> and so verse 8, this is where we get to some interesting aspects. He says, I will therefore that men, the men, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, he's talked about the importance of prayer, first importance, prayer. And he's mentioned men several times in this chapter up to now. But every time he's went, mentioned the word men, it, it really is simply a, a Greek word that means mankind in a generic sense, neither male nor female. And so, for instance, he says uh, that supplications, uh, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. That's anthropos, okay, from which we get anthropology, the study of man. And it's not masculine, it's mankind. God will have all mankind to be saved, male and female. And then he says in verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. Intercession be made for all men, will have all men, mankind to be saved. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, God and mankind. The man, and again, it's not emphasizing his masculinity there either. It's saying that in order to redeem mankind, he became a human being. So it's emphasizing his humanness, not his masculinity at that point, although he did come as a man. I'm not denying that for one second, but that's not what that text is telling us. He became part of the human race in order to redeem the human race, is what he's emphasizing. But when we get to verse 8, he uses a very different Greek word. He says, I will therefore that males pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So I will that the males pray everywhere. The males, masculine gender. Now, does that mean that Paul doesn't value the prayers of women? Not a bit. Uh, in fact, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 5, you'll notice that when it comes to supporting widows in the assembly, he says, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate, trusting in God, and continueth in supplication and prayers night and day. And so, in other words, the, the widow indeed, the widow who is worthy of the assembly's support. She's destitute. She's no other means of financially providing for herself. And what Paul says is, as an assembly, you invest in this sister. And why would you invest in this sister? Because she's shaped this assembly by her prayers. Not in the midweek prayer meeting, because she's not audibly taking the lead in prayer at the midweek prayer meeting. But she's praying night and day for the work of the assembly. And I want to tell you that there are assemblies today that are still in existence, probably because of the prayers of godly sisters who haven't given up on God for that local testimony. But they're not praying in the prayer meeting because they said, I'll have the males pray for the prayer meeting, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. But she's a woman of prayer. And, and we can see that, can't we? We can see it by example in the Old Testament. Do you remember the dark, dark days of the book of Judges? Remember how bleak it was? And then we come into 1 Samuel and things are going to change. But where was the starting point of the change? was a woman. Her name was Hannah. Do you remember Hannah? And Hannah says, Lord, I'm not content with barrenness. I, I don't want to live with barrenness. I want fruitfulness. She didn't want to be a barren bride, and I don't want to be part of a barren bride either. And she began to pray, God, give me a son. I'll give him back to you. And that son would change the whole course of Israel's history. 
Samuel. And it begun with the old man's prayers. And I could give you so many examples of where that has happened. And certainly this epistle, 1 Timothy. Why is Timothy who he is? Well, it's not because of his dad. His dad was a dud. Sorry to say it, but Timothy's father was not a good father. But he had a godly mother and a godly grandmother. And that godly mother and that godly grandmother poured their hearts and souls into that boy. And when he heard the gospel, he turned out to be a great man of God. One of the few people in the New Testament, maybe the only person in the New Testament that's called a man of God, was Timothy. And the investment of those women. Not just that. You think of the impact of the revival called the Wesleyan Revival. John and Charles Wesley. And I want to just give John's own words. He said he learned more on his mother's knee than from all the theologians of England. In other words, Susanna Wesley was the impact behind the Wesley brothers in a day of great departure and great declension. And yet, here's a mother pouring into the lives of her children. And you read the story of, of the Wesley family that occasionally she would, she would put her apron over her head, go in a corner, and she'd be praying for her children. And they all remembered that. They never got that sight out of their heads. Mother was praying for them. That's something. And so as bleak as things are in our day, maybe there's some mother here who's the answer to the future of revival in our nation through her prayers. But she's not going to transgress what the Bible says about church order. Because remember we said how, how you should behave in the house of God. So let's just get some things straight right here. It's the house of God. It's not your house. Sometimes we think this is our house. Not our house. It's his house. And, and so he has the right to tell us how to behave in his house because it's his house. Right? And so we just have to do what he says because it's his house. I, I travel. I spend a lot of time in other people's houses, and I try and obey house rules. Right? Because I'm always a guest in the house. It's not my house. Now, in my own house, I do what I want. Well, within realm, we've got to check with the boss too. But, I, but, but you know what I'm saying, it's my house. If I want to make changes, I can make changes. But when I'm in somebody else's house, I can't just go and get a sledgehammer and knock a wall down because I don't like the way it is. It's not my house. I have to simply accept the rules in the house I'm staying in. And once you get that settled in your mind, that the assembly is the house of God, it solves all the problems. Whenever you think you've got some opinion or some right of how things should be done in the house, you'll always struggle. But the minute you say, Lord, this is your house. If you say that the men are to pray in your house, that's good enough for me. By the way, I, I'm glad that's the way it says it, because I've been in churches where they don't, they don't listen to this scripture. And the women do all the praying. And the men are happy to let the women do all the praying. Because they want to watch football. Not even the stuff you use your feet for. The other football that's fake. They, they want to watch that. And they don't want to be bothered spiritually. And in a local assembly... If all the men are like that, then we're finished. So God knows. He, that's why he designed the house of God like it, because he knows what man is like. And he said, look, this is the design. And this is why the design is like the design, because I know man better than you know man. And so man, I will that men pray. And, you know, it's a tragedy, in one sense, when we have this privilege to audibly leave the, lead the company in prayer, and we don't do it. And there's long, awkward silences. And what a, what a terrible thing it is. And we'll give an account for that. Now, let me just explain a little bit more about prayer, corporate prayer, for a moment. But I think it's important that we understand this principle. 
that when I pray in the assembly, I do not pray individually, but I pray representatively. Because I'm a priest. And when a priest goes in to do what he does, he's not uh, just do, doing it for himself. He's doing it as a representative of the people, isn't he? And so when you pray, it's not, you should never pray in I, me, my, and myself, but we, us, our, because you're praying on behalf of the whole assembly, right? And so as you're praying, we're praying along with you, male and female. In other words, in our hearts, we're saying, yes, amen, so be it. We want that to be true. And what happens then is that when you finish your prayer and you say amen and everybody else says, yes, so be it, right? Then what happened is you didn't just pray, the whole assembly prayed. You just led the assembly into the throne of God, but we all went with you. Because as you're praying, we're praying along with you. We're saying, yeah, amen, so be it. And so sometimes people use this, this argument, which is just a fallacy, they say, well, look, if we split up into small groups, then more people can pray. That's just nonsense. If I pray representatively and you're all praying with me, then everybody prayed. And you can't have more than all. I suppose if you're in the South, you can have all y'all. But you get, you get what I'm saying here. You pray and represent, not individually. And the whole assembly is praying along with you. Well, you go to prayer meeting, like I do this, this morning prayer meeting, and when the brothers are praying, I'm praying with them. I'm saying, yes, Lord, I want this. I, I, I. And then, you know, we're all muted, and then as soon as somebody prays, everybody comes and hits the mute button, they all say, amen. And the whole, the whole board of faces prayed. Not just the one person, we all prayed. See, that's what true biblical prayer is. And so it's not that the sisters are not praying. They're just not praying audibly. They're praying along. And I would just say this, even in terms of worship at the remembrance meeting, again, the men are always the ones who take the lead. But in the silences, sometimes the real worship ascends from the silent worship of the sisters. When they tell the Lord what they think of him. In silence. And you can speak in silence, can't you? There's been times when I've been preaching and I, I can't get off the runway. I just feel like I'm struggling. I've just got no liberty. And while I'm speaking to you, I'm praying to God and I'm saying, Lord, get me off the runway. Now, you're not hearing a word of it, but it's going on. And it's just re as real because it's coming from the bottom of my heart. Lord, I need help here. Right? But you can't hear it, but God can hear it. And so the sisters do pray. But it's not audibly. I will therefore men pray. And then it says everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And so the idea is this, holy hands. Uh, when a priest went into the tabernacle, one of the first places he went was the laver. Before he did anything else, he washed his dirty hands and his feet. Because he was coming into the presence of God. And he had the defilement and dirt of the world on him and he wanted to become into his presence clean. And so he says, I will live that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Now, let me just talk about lifting up hands. Nothing wrong with lifting up holy hands. Sometimes, because of some extremes in the charismatic movement, there has been a tendency among non-charismatic Christians to say, we don't pray like that. So we kind of straight jacket prayer, okay? Now, it's one of the legitimate postures for prayer in Scripture. And we've got to get our convictions, not because we react against what another group does, but based on what the text of Scripture says. And so it's okay to pray like this. And I think it's a great posture because it's saying this, it's saying, Lord, I'm empty-handed. I've got nothing to bargain with. You have everything. I have nothing. Fill these empty hands. Right? Isn't that a wonderful posture? And sometimes, I'll tell you a secret, when I'm praying on my own, I'll sometimes walk around the house, and I'll, I know you've kind of, this is it, I'm shot. My cat was finished in some of your minds. But I don't care, really. But I sometimes pray like that and say, Lord, I don't have anything to offer. You have everything. And I need it. Sometimes, a legitimate posture is prostration. 
on the ground. I've been in prayer, assembly prayer meetings where every brother was laying on the carpet crying out to God for blessing. It was a pretty good prayer meeting, I want to tell you. Energized. Kneeling. These are all different postures for prayer, and they're legitimate postures for prayer. So let's not, in a sense, straitjacket people. Now, we don't want to draw attention to ourselves, and if it's going to put everybody else off their supper, I certainly won't do it in public if it's going to cause people to be upset. But at the same time, it's legitimate. Lifting up holy hands, and then without wrath, because sometimes we can be mad at our fellow believers, and sometimes I've heard people pray, and what they weren't, were doing is they weren't praying to God, they were, they were giving a brother a rebuke in prayer. And <clears throat> it was the flesh with a capital F. And God is not going to hear that kind of prayer. If you have something against your brother, you go and deal with your brother, and then come back to the prayer meeting. So don't come mad at somebody and pray, right? It's, it's, I don't want to hear that, God says, without wrath, and then without doubting. You see, God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But one of the things that he says is that when you come to God, you have to believe that he is, right? You have to have faith, right? Pray in faith, pray believingly. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We need to pray believingly. And, and here's the interesting thing. You see, <clears throat> we're living in a day where unbelief is, is very prevalent. And part of the difficulty is this, that it does actually limit God. I know this is strange, but it tells us in the Psalms that Israel limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, I don't know how you limit God, but it, clearly they did. And the Lord Jesus, there was one region where it says he could do no mighty works there for their unbelief. Tragic, huh? It's not that he didn't want to do mighty works there. He couldn't do any mighty works there because somehow he tied himself to the belief of his people and they didn't believe him. Oh, that's scary, isn't it? So when we pray, pray in faith. Pray believing. Right? And so lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. It says, in like manner also the women. Now he's talking about the females. And he talks about, and it seems, seems a bit surprising that he, he jumps from the men and their active participation and begins to talk about the adornment of the women at the prayer meeting. And you say, well, what's on his mind? Why is he thinking that way? Well, the first thing he says about them, he says, he says the, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's the first thing he says. Women dress modestly. If ever there was a needed word, it's that to this, because so much dress, female dress today, is provocative. And so they to dress with modesty. And I can remember being at a Lord's Supper, and this was in another country, and we were sat in a circle. And there was a lady across from me, and she was an older lady, she wasn't young, but she had a low cut dress on, and the whole breaking of bread, I couldn't lift my head up. I was looking at my shoes the whole time. Because I didn't want to deal with that. I'm there to remember the Lord. I don't want to be dealing with this stuff. And it was totally devastating to my appreciation of the person and work of the Lord Jesus because I was, it was a distraction. And I'm fighting this distraction the whole time. And it should never be. And so Paul says... Sisters, if you want to have a good effect on the prayer meeting in the local assembly, put some clothes on. Dress modestly. Don't dress to provoke. Don't put goods on show that are not available for other people. Cover them up. Okay? And, and again, men, got to just tell you this, sisters, men are wired by sight. They can't help it. That's just the way they, they're wired. They're wired by sight. And if they see something like that, it's even the most spiritual man, it's hard for them not to look. So don't make it hard on the brethren. He says, dress with modesty. 
And I think that's, that's reasonable. Because you're not drawing attention to yourself. We're not there to draw attention to self. We're there to get our eyes on the Lord. And so it's very important that we don't do anything that would distract. And, and you don't want to be guilty of that. You don't want to stand before the Lord Jesus and, and to have to explain why you cause such distraction in the local assembly because of your provocative dress. I hope you don't want to do that. And, and so that's what he's saying. In modest apparel, the shamefacedness in, and sobriety. And, and so this self-conscious modesty that doesn't want anyone distracted from seeing the Lord in all his beauty. Shamefacedness has the idea of decency, a modesty that shrinks from overstepping the limits of womanly reserve. A kind of blushing at the very thought of it. And then sobri sobriety, soundness of mind and judgment. And then it talks about the hairstyle. And it says um, uh, that the woman... It says, uh, in like manner also women adorn themselves, modest apparel, shame, fadeness, sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, this seems to be a prevailing problem in Asia, the province of Asia, biblical province of Asia, because if you look at 1 Peter 3, you'll see Peter says exactly the same thing. He says in 1 Peter 3, verse 3, whose adorning, let it not be that of outward adorning, of plating the hair, of wearing of gold, and putting on of apparel. So clearly there was an Asian problem. And this Asian problem probably was connected with the worship of the goddess Diana. And from what we understand, that uh, Diana's uh, vestal virgins or temple prostitutes, that they did their hair in such a way it looked like a Christmas tree. They had all kinds of gold and stuff weaved into it. And, and so that's what they looked like. And so what he's saying is don't take your cues from the world in your dress code. And remember, we, we said in 1 Corinthians 11 that woman's hair is her personal glory. And the idea is that you don't want men to be distracted from the glory of God by your personal glory, like Lucifer did when he unfurled his glory in the presence of God's glory. So you, you go to great pains actually to cover the competing glory. And you put a covering on your glory so that his glory is seen. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And so he's just saying, let's do with these things. And then he says, <clears throat> uh, that which becoming women professing godliness with good works. And we've talked about examples of that. The Mrs. Binney that we talked about last night. Somebody who gives this example of great godliness. And it's lovely when you, you, you meet women like that, they leave that impression, here's a godly woman. It's wonderful to have that impression, uh, that, that she's not drawing attention to herself. She, she, she wants the Lord to get all the glory. She wants people to see the Lord, not her. And, and that's a wonderful thing. And then it says, let a woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now again, it's just talk sense here. When Paul says, let a woman learn in silence, he's talking about the theme of behavior in the house of God. Now, some people say, well, women can't learn if they don't, can't ask questions. Well, who says that? What does God say? He says, let the women learn in silence. He said in 1 Corinthians 40, if they've got any questions, let them ask their men folk at home, not in the assembly. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got a question now session coming up. <laughs> But you see, yeah, let a woman learn in silence. Now, I want to just think about this for a moment because Paul is pretty consistent. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. We read this, and we'll break in in verse 33. He says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And then he says this, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, if you study 1 Corinthians carefully, you'll see several times he appeals to the universal practice of all the churches. It's kind of a running theme through 1 Corinthians. So he's doing it again. As in all the churches of the saints, let your women keep silence in the churches. 
for it's not permitted for them to speak, but they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. And then he says this, what came the word of God out from you, or came it to you only? You see, when Paul keeps appealing to the universal practice of all the churches, what he's saying to them is, how come you're different? Why are you doing your own thing in Corinth? And they were. They were doing their own thing. They weren't following the apostolic teaching that had been taught in all the other churches. They're marching to a different tune. They're doing their own thing. And so he says, did the word of God just come to you only? That you have this opinion? Did it not come to anybody else? Are you the sole recipients? Because you're the only ones doing this stuff. And then he says, if anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual. Now, can you imagine? I want you just to imagine the Corinthians when he asked this question. Any of you guys think you're prophets or spiritual? <laughs> Every hand went up. Can you imagine? They all thought they were prophets and spiritual. And he says, okay, I'm going to give you the true test of spirituality now. You really think you're spiritual? He says, I'm going to give you a test. Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Is that interesting? Paul is saying that what I am writing to you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, what did the Lord Jesus say about his commandments? He said, if you love me, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Paul says the things I write are the commandments of the Lord. Now, how could he, what he write be the commandments of the Lord? Because the truth that he conveyed in the word of God, he got from the risen, glorious head of the church. That which I have received from the Lord, I have delivered unto you. So the things that he writes are the commandments of the Lord. And again, in the house of God, who sets the house rules? Well, the Lord does, right? It's his house. And clearly, it's not got anything to do with culture, because he says... I suffer a woman not to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence for, and he appeals to Genesis. Not culture, Genesis. For Adam was formed, first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she'll be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So, he appeals to creation order. Adam was first formed, then Eve. Man was first in creation, and then the woman was first in transgression. That's what it says, isn't it? Adam was not deceived, the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, it's interesting, when you get elsewhere in Paul's writings, like Romans 5, who does God blame the whole thing on? Adam, right? Because headship brings with it responsibility. He's the head. And so through one man, sin came into the world, death by sin. He should have been a better leader in the home and taught her better than he did. But nevertheless, he says, this is the reason that women are not to teach nor usurp authority over the man to be in silence because of creation order. And so you might say, verse 15, okay, here's a sister, and you're saying to me, I can't preach, and I can't pray, and I've got to learn in silence. So what's the point? Like, I can't do anything. I might as well stay at home and watch soaps. I mean, I can't do anything in the assembly. That's what you might be tempted to think, right? He says, Never, notwithstanding, she shall be saved. Now, not saved eternally. It's not salvation by reproduction. Because barren women could never be saved, right? So saved from what in childbearing? Saved from a sense of what's my purpose? What, do I, what can I do, you see? What's my calling? Well, here's your calling. Your calling is the childbearing. Your calling is to invest in these precious lives 
that can be the next John Wesley, that can be the next Charles Wesley, that can be the next Timothy, that can be somebody who can shape the world and the assembly for God. That's your role. And that's a wonderful role, isn't it? You can shape the next generation of preachers. You don't like this generation of preachers? Well, you can do something about it. You can pour your lives into the next generation of preachers. And so you, you don't have to feel like I've got no contribution to make here. Why is Timothy where he is? <laughs> Timothy is where he is because he had a godly mother and a godly grandmother that poured their lives into him. And he's shaping assembly testimony all around the world at this moment in time. Praise God, you see. So God is saying, no, no, you, we've got a role, sisters. You have a very vital role. You, you can impact things. You say, well, I'm, I'm not married. What am I supposed to do? Well, you can still impact other people's children by investing in them. I know single sisters that pour their lives into other children and do a wonderful job. So there's lots of opportunity, and there's much more we could say, but I'm already over time. And we, we don't want to cut short this discussion. So I'm going to stop and pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We pray again that we would become a people committed to praying. Uh, Lord, we pray you'd revive our prayer meetings, revive our gospel meetings, and revive our convictions that you know what's best for the house of God, because it's your house. Help us to simply submit to what you say, trusting ourselves to thy wisdom and divine counsel, rather than having the arrogance of thinking we know better than you. And so help us in these things, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.